Welcome back to the lab. Welcome back to EE for everyone. Today we're going to round out our series on how to use EDA tools with a walkthrough of PCB design and library management in KiCad. This is the third video in this series, and it should be the last one unless we get a lot of questions, but uh, it should be a really awesome walkthrough. So uh, let's dive right in. I realized we let the scope of our previous video get a little bit larger. And I didn't realize that. I mean, I saw the amount of footage and I was like, oh, this is going to be ridiculous. But it wasn't until I started prepping for this video that I realized that I had totally stomped on what I had planned. And we did simulation, schematic capture, library management, and a little bit more in our previous video. So that leaves only a couple steps left. That leaves layout. Before we jump in, I want to acknowledge a mistake that I'm sure somebody noticed and I'm sure somebody left a comment about it, um, but the pin numbering on this IC was not correct. I forgot to reset all of these to pin 9, which meant that none of them were tied to ground, so they should all have the same pin number as that center net because obviously they will be electrically connected. The copper is connected. So yeah, that was a little goofy. It made, made some things look odd. but. All right, that's about all I need to say about that. You might recognize this schematic, given that we were only talking about it in the previous video. It wasn't that long ago. Basically, we have a preliminary implementation. This is by no means finished. That's why we put the for educational purposes only on all of our schematic pages. Regardless, it's probably going to look pretty similar to how it will in the end. I will very likely choose an appropriate current limit sense resistor rather than this hodgepodge series parallel arrangement and we'll probably add some other components like we noticed some issues about needing a fuse on vbus notice some voltage limits that we might not be okay with notice some failure modes that could lead to damaging a board and we just need to think about um, if we're okay with these sorts of failures or if we're not and if we're not okay with them we'll need to come up with a mitigation plan, figure out a way to limit these fault events from rippling through our system. But that's not really the scope of what we're doing today. This is not the motor series, so we're not worried about the design. What we're worried about is how to actually capture this. So the first step is pretty simple, and it's just setting up your layout page in a similar way that we did the others. We'll vision. Quite excellent. And we can see the title block, and it's very easy to read. <laughs> Dark red on black is now present. Let's pull in our components. There's a... There we go. Update PCB. Grabs all the parts. Now we have them. Excellent. And so this is where there's a feature of KeyCAD that may not be obvious if you're zoomed out. So when I grab this component in the layout, and I would usually have this on two separate screens, you know, one full window for what I'm working on, and then maybe a couple other screens that are split two or four ways so for reference. But this is a great feature of the tool. Not only the, um, the rat's nest, which is right up here. You can enable or disable that. The rat's nest, which shows you where each component should be connected, which is incredibly helpful. But more than that, when you grab a component, it'll highlight that component in the other tool. Oh, goodness me, I did not mean to do that. So with the combination of these two, you can just kind of walk through your design and you can pretty quickly place things without much of a worry. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Let's go into board setup. There are a couple things that are incredibly helpful here. First of all, you can change your physical stack up. So you can change it from a two layer board to an N layer board. So you can do more advanced layouts with 
higher layer counts. That's one of the things that I love about this tool. There's no limit to the amount of components, nets, layers. There's no limits. It's just a tool for you to use, and I love that. There's no paywalls here. You can also adjust the overall thickness of your board and the electrical properties of each dielectric material for use in impedance control. Specify a board finish, solder mask, or paste. Give some defaults for how components come into the design. And now you start to get into design rules. And design rules is really what I wanted to show you. You can specify things like minimum clearance between tracks, minimum track width, the annular ring around a drilled hole or a via or via diameter. You can really start to specify these things so that your design is more manufacturable. Uh, they're not sponsored. GLC PCB is just a website that is very well organized. I've used them for boards and for simple assemblies before. I've never used them for production boards. Based on some comments, I've heard that some people have had some meh experiences with them doing production boards. And I've never done it, so I really can't say. But what I can say is that every board that they've delivered to me seems to be a good quality and at a reasonable price. So take that for what it is. We're here for their PCB capabilities. You go to minimum clearance. They have a hole-to-hole -hole clearance of 0.5 millimeters. There we go. So now we've filled in those from the JLC PCB spec. It's pretty simple stuff. You just need to copy their capabilities into your design, and that'll give you some real-time DRC, where if you were to place a component that would violate those rules, it would either not allow you to do it, or it would throw a DRC error down, down the road. So let's define a net class called power. And this is where we'll need to pull up our PCB toolkit. And all I'm really looking for here is the current handling capability of these traces. Say yes, there's a plane present, so we'll have a plane on the bottom layer. I believe we're set to 2.2 amps, so let's, there we go. So minimum of 0.35 millimeters. Let's type that in. And then we need to do the same thing for our vias. We need to make sure that it can handle our current. Right now they have a 0.4 millimeter via with a via size of 0.8. Let's solve. That's rated for 2.48 amps, so we should be fine, just fine. So now you can see that we're starting to really get into some of the physical implementation details here, and I wish I was a little more organized with it, but I mean, sometimes you're organized, sometimes you're not. But as long as you remember to do everything, that's great. I think ideally, you know, building a checklist and going down would be fantastic. These are all things that need to happen, right? You need to specify a stack up. You need to specify copper thickness. And the copper thickness impacts your trace width. So sometimes a thicker copper layer, like if you were to make a one and a half ounce or a two ounce outer layer, you could handle even more power. The natural trade-off is that you can see that trapezoidal etch. That is real. That's not fake. That's a real thing that happens when they etch. So you'll start to need to have a minimum spacing to accommodate that trapezoidal etch. Okay, I'm getting distracted. So what I'm trying to say is we want to take V-Bus, sometimes ground. We'll handle that in a second. The motor outputs and whatever the heck that shunt is. And we are going to assign a new net class called power to the selected nets. You can see their net class is now power. What did that do? Well, now when we're routing these traces, they'll be just a little bit thicker than their counterparts. You can see that VBUS is thicker than the other trace. And now as we're routing the board, you'll notice that that constraint is upheld. And how you handle the ground conductor for these is a little bit up to you. You can select multiple traces and just adjust the trace width to whatever you want. That is an option that you have. In general, you want to keep your copper balanced so that the thermal load's about the same, it'll avoid tombstoning. I've noticed you can generally handle a mismatch of about a factor of three before you have significant issues. That is, you can have three times as much copper on one side of the part than the other, and you might be okay.
looks reasonable to me. If I were to be finishing this off, I would add a serial number label. I might plan for that to be a sticker. I'd add a part number, and then I'd add a revision, some information to help keep track of what this is when you find it in a bin <laughs> three years from now and you have no idea what to do with it. And depending on where you want to get this fabricated, I would probably end up adding some fabrication information about like the stack up and I'd specify layer one is this, just do one ounce finished copper, layer two, one ounce finished copper, call out the dielectric material. You could call out any rating you want, like 94V0. Uh, you could call out a whole bunch of stuff. You could call out which IPC class you want this assembled to or any other standards that are applicable to your design. You should add a whole bunch of fab notes and you, know, you can come in here and add dimensions to your PCB. And all of these things are really, really, really good bits of attention to detail that will go a long way in making sure that whoever you send this design to will receive it and be able to populate it. We'll walk through the steps of doing the manufacturing exports, but just for reference here, I want to pull this up and kind of show you what this would look like if we were to build it. It's a pretty small board right now, but it's because it's not really a finished board. It just has uh, you know, a copper plane on the back, which would help this part dissipate some heat. One thing that we didn't acknowledge before is how via in pad like this, that technology can actually lead to some really nasty manufacturability issues if the solder from your pad starts to wick down into those vias. Uh, it can lead to a starved solder joint on the top layer, which means poor thermal conductivity. You know, there's some volume inside of each of those cylinders, and that needs to be accounted for. I think it's obvious to see that if this current shunt were one resistor, this layout would be a little bit nicer. and yeah, it, it, there's a lot of a lot of details that need to be managed, you know. Like for example, this trace that we made a little bit thicker could be a copper pore, that could be a plane. And it wouldn't hurt anything. It it would lead to a lower impedance and a lower resistance. That that's a good thing. <laughs> but what we have laid down is sufficient for the amount of current flowing through the trace. One thing that we might be able to appreciate here is we can see the solder paste actually extruded on top of the pad. Show silk screens, show solder paste. Let's turn off the solder paste. It'll re-render. Oh no! Our paste is over the... Ah! Found another footprint error. Come on! Yeah. There, there it is. <laughs> That's what we needed to do. <laughs> so now we shrunk the paste down to the same size as the pad which is what they asked us to do. But if we render in the paste, we should see the paste comes to exactly the same spot as this pad, and we'll see that the paste stops a little bit early on the other pad. Let's see it. <sighs> yep, there it is. There's the difference from the copper-defined pad to the solder mask-defined pad. And if we wanted to make this look a little bit more like their reference design, that'll just help with power dissipation. That's, that's about all. Um, other than that, there's not a huge difference in what you'll see. Um, but that expanding that copper pad a little bit wider, like they asked for in the footprint, is going to be a pretty big help. Let's go to our design rule checks and run them. All right, yeah. <laughs> a track is not connected. Yep, this is not a finished design. So that is expected, though that would be alarming if you got that in your finished design. So that's about that. And as you're looking to actually build the board, there's a couple files that you'll need. All of this, of course, is covered in more detail, and I'm guessing you know where. If we pull up PCB New in their documentation, and we look at the generating output, you can look at everything. It goes through every option in detail. It goes through what the drill files are. It goes through everything, every, every, everything that you would ever want to know. So you can choose your version of the tool. And 
it's pretty phenomenal, actually. So make sure to check out these documents. These are going to be very, very helpful for you as you're walking through these steps. Do not neglect them. They, they, you can tell they put so much work, the organization here, to um, really lay out how to use their tools in detail and to actually give you a convenient way to switch from version to version to get an appropriate tutorial for what you're looking for. Like, this is phenomenal documentation and version control information. So PCB design always gets me excited. It is so much fun to watch something like this come together. You start with a simulation or a, just a thought in your head. You start doing some analysis. You get through the schematic, and then you get to capture your PCB. And you have this linked library of orderable components, and every pin is mapped, and there's just so many details, so many little things that are being managed by the EDA tool. And it really shows the value of an EDA tool. Tracking all of this in a spreadsheet or through some other means manually would be a lot of work. And that's why we lean on EDA tools to manage some of these constraints, these complexities, and ultimately reduce defects in finished designs. And I think that's something we can all be excited about, whether it be your computer, a medical device, a camera, a comp it, everything, right? Having fewer defects in electronic devices is that's a very good thing for the world. So I'm very grateful for EDA tools. And hopefully after watching these videos, you have a better understanding of how they work, what they're used for, and some of those core elements, core features that you'll find in all of them. So thank you very much for watching. A special thank you to those who have supported us via Patreon or YouTube. It really means a lot. Thank you. Also, a special thank you to those who have supported us through interacting with the comments, like button, subscribing, anything that you do to interact with or engage with the EE for Everyone community really helps us a lot. So thank you. Most of all, I hope that you learned something great today, and I hope to see you again soon. Thanks for watching EE for Everyone, and thank you for staying till the end. Bye.